OAuth stands for Open Authorization, and in its current version 2.0, it is an authorization framework that enables a third-party application to obtain limited access to an HTTP service. To understand what this actually means, let's first take a look at what problem we're trying to solve with OAuth. So let's say we have some uh, drawing application that runs in a browser and that connects to some backend that stores the artwork and some data store. Now, let's assume that we also want to automatically upload that artwork from the drawing application to our Google Drive. The issue here is that from the perspective of Google, this drawing application is a third-party application. The two apps literally have nothing to do with each other whatsoever. And on top of that, they're even separate legal entities. Prior to OAuth 2.0, the third-party application, in our case, the drawing application, would just ask for your credentials and then use that credentials to access the desired service directly. And if you were really out of luck, then it would have even stored your username and plain text password in the database to not ask you for your password all the time. And then OAuth came along and fixed this mess. OAuth is all about giving a limited access to APIs. And to understand how it really works, we first need to understand OAuth terminology. The API we want to get access to, in this case, the Google Drive API, is called the resource server or the protected resource. From Google's perspective, the drawing application is a third-party application which is called the client. Our user, our modern-day Picasso, is the resource owner because he owns the Google Drive account we want to access. OAuth also introduces a new entity called the authorization server. The OAuth 2.0 authorization server issues access and refresh tokens and gives third-party applications limited access to the protected resource. Think of it like a bouncer who decides uh, who is going to get access and also what API permissions you're going to get. However, before any third-party application, in this case our drawing application, can make use of OAuth, it first needs to be registered with the authorization server. This usually boils down to a one-time effort of the drawing app developer registering his application with Google by filling out a form. When the developer of the drawing applications registers the app, he gets a client ID that uniquely identifies his application for the authorization server. If his third-party application can keep data secret, then in all 2.0 terms, the client is confidential and also gets client credentials to authenticate against the authorization server. In the simplest case, the client credential is just a password that is called a client secret. Think of the client ID as a unique username and the client secret as a password. OAuth also supports other means of authenticating against the authorization server. For example, mutual TLS, which requires a certificate exchange and which provides much better security. Let's quickly talk about the client credentials a little bit more. So let's say you have a single page application without your own backend. Then this application cannot keep client credentials secret because anyone can just, you know, open the dev tools and then just get their client credentials out. With mobile apps, it's a bit similar. I mean, if you package your client credentials within the app, then anyone could just take a look at the bundle and then extract the credentials. Therefore, if you have a pure standalone mobile app or a pure single page application without any backend, you will not get client credentials. So no client secret and also no uh, private and public keys and so on. You will only get a client ID. These types of clients are called public clients. Now, if you were to have your own backend, things would be different because now you can actually protect secrets and upon registration, you would get client credentials in the form of a client secret, for example. It's also worth mentioning that a mobile application can also register itself dynamically with your authorization server. This is called dynamic client registration, which we're not gonna cover in this video. Just remember that in theory, you can make a standalone mobile app, a confidential client, if you use dynamic client registration. How do we now get our artwork into our Google Drive? It's actually quite simple. So we just put a login with Google button on our third party application. And when the user clicks login with Google, he gets redirected to the Google authorization server with a bunch of query parameters. As part of the redirect, you have to put at least the drawing apps client ID as a query parameter and the response type of the authorization request. We will learn about the response type in a minute. Because of the redirect, the user is only entering his credentials on a Google website. And therefore we are not exposing the user's credential 
to the third party applications. Now, after a user has authenticated and the Google authorization server knows his identity, it shows a screen you have probably already seen thousands of times. This app would like to access your Google account and is asking for a couple of permissions. In our case, Google Drive permissions. The logo, the app description, and everything that we basically see on this page is exactly what we have entered when we registered the application. The permissions are the scopes that you configured during the registration before. You can also add scopes as query parameters when you redirect if you don't want to get the default scopes you specified when you registered the application. Now, if you click yes, the authorization server redirects the user back to the third party application. The authorization server now creates a so-called authorization code and attaches it as a query parameter while it is redirecting the user back to the original application, in our case, the drawing application. Think of the authorization code as a short-lived one-time voucher, which you can exchange for an access token with a limited lifetime and with a limited privileges. The drawing app backend now takes this authorization code and sends it along with its client ID and the client credentials, in the simplest case, a client secret, to the authorization server. Depending on the authorization server's configuration, the client may also get a refresh token. This is a longer lived token that allows you to get fresh access tokens when the access token you have has expired. The client can then use this access token on the protected resource to finally get access. Let's take a closer look at what these access and refresh tokens really are. So once you've obtained them, they fulfill different purposes. Think of an access token like one of these cards you get at a hotel. It provides you access to your room only and maybe to the gym and to the breakfast room, but that's about it. You cannot access your neighbor's room, for example. If your access token expires and you happen to have a refresh token, you can actually use that refresh token to obtain another access token so that you don't have to annoy the users to log in all the time. In most deployments, both the access and the refresh tokens are structured tokens, usually JSON web tokens. Now it's worth mentioning that OAuth doesn't require the token to be structured and it also doesn't require it to be a JSON web token. However, using structured tokens has the advantage that the resource server can validate the token signature locally with a public key. While the resource server could also ask the authorization server if a token is valid or not every time it gets a request, this would lead to very high bandwidth consumption and at some point also to scalability issues. So the process of having an authorization server check the validity of a token is called token introspection. And this is part of another OAuth RFC. The OAuth flow we just saw is just one out of a bunch of so-called OAuth grant types that can be found in the OAuth RFCs. A grant type is a way on how you can obtain access to an API. The grant type we just looked at is the so-called authorization code grant. OAuth actually supports several more grant types. The client credentials grant is all about machine to machine communication without the involvement of a human user. Then there's also the implicit grant and the resource owner password grant. Now you can forget about those two right away because they are marked as the must not use in the OAuth security current best practices. Mark the words there, yeah, it says must not use. It doesn't say shouldn't use, it says must not use. Why? Because these two are just insecure. Well, and then there's also the device grant, which is for devices that don't have a browser or where typing something is very cumbersome, for example, a smart TV. So that is all in a nutshell. Thank you so much for watching. Leave a like and subscribe to the channel and let me know in the comments what other topics you want me to cover next. See you around. Bye bye.